The most bipartisan impeachment vote in American history still falls 10 votes shy of conviction. While back in Michigan, the GOP's leader in the Senate feeds the conspiracy fire. And the pandemic leads the former medical director for the city of Detroit to make a national plea for universal health care. Today is Sunday, February 14th, 2021, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, right, welcome to Flashpoint on this Valentine's Day 2021. It was anything but candy hearts and flowers yesterday, of course, in the United States Senate. We figured on Friday that things would end quickly, and they did, but only after a bizarre fight over whether to call witnesses after evidence emerged about what the president knew about the insurrection and when he knew it and just as critically what he didn't do about it. But in a strange about face, and that's a much kinder way of putting it than many critics on social media, Democrats agreed to forego witnesses and move right to closing arguments and the vote, which saw seven Republicans breaking ranks and voting to convict. Now that the president would escape conviction long seemed a certainty, but now that the whole thing is done, where does it leave the United States? Are we as divided as ever, or is there a little confusion among some of the president's supporters as they watch people like the seven senators and former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley breaking ranks with Donald Trump? Certainly, Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky has left some folks confused. He has refused to go along with the conspiracies about the Michigan election results, which, by the way, were reinforced this week by an audit that showed them basically on the money. But Shirky was caught on video insisting the insurrectionists at the Capitol were not Trump supporters. He then apologized for that, only to be caught on yet another microphone doubling down on the theory. Now, I had hoped he would be here this morning to talk about it, but I can't even get anyone in his office to tell me no, much less tell me yes. We're going to talk about all that coming up. Also, the former health director for the city of Detroit and former gubernatorial candidate, Dr. Abdul El Sayed, has co-authored a new book urging Americans to consider universal health care. He believes the pandemic has greatly strengthened the case. We're going to talk to him, too, all today on Flashpoint. What a week it has been. Former President Trump escapes impeachment conviction for a second time, though with more Republicans voting in favor than many expected, and a wild week for the leader of the GOP at the state capitol. Let's talk about it all with Zoe Clark, co-host of It's Just Politics on Michigan Radio, Guy Gordon of the serendipitously named Guy Gordon Show on WJR, uh, rounding out the radio trio is Stephen Henderson from Detroit Today on WDET, and from the Detroit News editorial page editor, Nolan Finley. Gang, uh, happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for being here today. I'm curious, let me start out with kind of your thumbnail thoughts and your takeaways from what we watched, uh, in particular yesterday, but in general, over the last week. Uh, Guy, let me start with you. Uh, we didn't see a constitutional conviction, but I do think we saw the beginnings of a political conviction. Um, if you look at the GOP senators, I think they're beginning to try to distance them, themselves from Donald Trump. Um, the real question for me is in terms of what happens next. Will we see a 9-11 commission to look into this? Will we see witnesses called to tell us what happened into the Oval? And what I'm detecting with my listeners, Devin, is that while there are those that could see him shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and still be okay yeah. with it, I think that this idea of dereliction of duty is gaining some traction and is troubling to many of my listeners who said, you know, if we saw a good conservative Republican with the values without the drama, I could vote for them. They have a hard time defending the dereliction of duty. What happened from 115 until hmm. the next day? Interesting. Nolan, are you sensing a fraying of uh, sort of the, the Donald Trump power base or is that still where the Republican Party largely remains? I think you saw some of that um, on January 6th. I think it, bro it was a breaking point for a lot of people, but not necessarily all. I don't think the events of the last week changed anyone's mind. Uh, it was a continuation of what people have been seeing for the last four years with this obsession with getting Donald Trump. Uh, but if you, you know, you've got to look at what's happening out in the districts. Peter Meyer over the weekend, moderate Republican, was censured for his impeachment vote. Uh, you're seeing that over and over in these districts. Uh, throughout the country where people who uh, supported the impeachment, Republicans who supported the impeachment or who weren't vocal enough in support of uh, Trump are being censured. So I wouldn't I you know, I wouldn't uh, uh, read this as an absolute erosion of that uh, love for Trump. Mm. 
Stephen, there were so many things that I've watched here that I did not fully understand. I didn't understand Mitch McConnell's sort of afterward uh, that he put forward yesterday. I didn't understand the Democrats asking for witnesses and then uh, deciding against that. I didn't understand Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham huddling with the president's attorneys. Um, what are your takeaways from what we watched? Well, some of this is the, the, the nature of uh, impeachment, which is you know, a unique feature of our constitutional system. And it's happened so infrequently that nobody knows what they're supposed to be doing, I think. Yeah. Um, but but on the Republican side, you know, you do have a, a crisis of, of, of moral conviction. Uh, you have a party that has slid uh, all the way into uh, not just excusing uh, the behavior of uh, a maniacal uh, leader, uh, but 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 looking the other way in, in, in this case at death. I mean, I, I posted on social media yesterday. Would uh, the GOP uh, leadership have been so cowardly uh, in this instance if uh, members of Congress had been among the dead on January sixth? Why aren't they Why aren't they more exercised about the fact that uh, these rioters killed a police officer inside the, the Capitol? I mean, the rot inside the party that prevents them from holding. The, the person who started this accountable uh, is is so dangerous and and threatens the ver the party's very viability at least at a national level. Mm. And Zoe, give me your thoughts on uh, what you felt we were watching play out here, and where do we go from here? I, I think everything that's been said is is exactly accurate, and I, I think one of the issues is all of these things are happening on hyper speed. It feels like yeah. over the past yeah. few years, right? And whether that be social media, the way we interact with each other, the way we interact and get our news, right? So I think what we are is watching um, a party that is figuring out and struggling who it is. Um, but I think because we're doing it in this sort of hyper lapse time, it feels a little like whiplash. Whereas in periods in American history before, when these sort of resorting and, and co-opting of voters has happened. It's sometimes been at a longer period of time um, and, and with more perspective than we have right now. The fact is we are in the middle of it and watching and trying to predict the outcome of something we just don't know how it ends and how it plays out. <laughs> we are building the plane while we're flying it, as somebody pointed Amen. out yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy, it's interesting, though, because so much of this foment was all built on, uh, as, as was described, the great lie about about what happened in the election. And I, when I listen to your program, and I listen to you, I, I try to listen to a bit of your show every day. You and I have been friends for a long time. You are still trying to put out these fires. You get callers every day who still believe that there was something wrong, in particular in the Michigan election, where it was such a wide margin, it's, it's, it's bizarre to debate it. Does the audit that came through this week, and does what we just watched happen in, in the impeachment, does it change any of that? No. You know, if you had a dung beetle meme, you could put it over me right now, uh, Devin. That's right. That's right. I feel like on a daily basis. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally get that. I, I don't think that that audit resonated with anybody. They think this is corrupt at, at the core. If you say, well, how can we have a recount of paper ballots? And then you still believe that the Dominion machines were fraudulent. Uh, well, that's because uh, they, there'll be a change of subject. They'll say that, well, those were those were fraudulent absentee ballots to begin with. So I, I don't know that that's ever going to move forward. The real question for me is uh, those that didn't stand with President Trump as he was involved in the big lie, how will they be punished? He doesn't have Twitter to do that for him anymore. Right. So will he put money into a campaign against Peter Meyer and Fred Upton? You know, how will he use his considerable political weight going forward? And how can the GOP and the state distance themselves from him when he is such a potent fundraiser? So right. And uh, Nolan, as we then let's let's zoom in a little bit here and, 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 and look more closely at the Michigan uh, GOP and Michigan Republicans, I, I need you to explain to me what's going on here, uh, exactly what we're watching happen with Mike Shirky. Well, I mean, Mike Shirky um, is who he is. He says oh, he has over throughout his career said a lot of things that, uh, you know, raised a lot of eyebrows. And I can't, you know, I'm not his spokesman. I can't speak for what was in his mind when he said that. And, but, you know, this is who he is. And, you know, he apologizes and then he took the apology back. I just soon he not apologize if he doesn't mean it, but well, right, it would right. be nice to hear an explanation for him about what he was talking about.
And, and to the broader Michigan GOP, we watched this fight with Laura Cox and, oh, and Ron Weiser. Um, where, where does this leave the state party right now, Nolan? Well, I think that where they've been many, many times in the past and where the state Democratic Party has been many, many times in the past. I mean, they, they're they're divided. They're angry at each other. But that won't last because uh, by the time the next election rolls around, they'll be angrier at, at Democrats than they are at themselves. Ron Weiser is uh, a masterful fundraiser, uh, and he's been a very successful party chairman in his last two go rounds at it. The Republican Party won big, uh, big gains each time Ron Weiser was the party chair. I suspect they will uh, come together under his leadership again. Uh, Stephen, as as we look toward trying to bring everybody back together, I find myself wondering, do Democrats need Republicans to find a way to get together first to be able to do that? Or uh, with this more splintered, uh, if, if that's what is in, ends up happening with the Republican Party, is that the opportunity to get everybody to, back together? Well, I mean, I do think that, uh, you know, Republicans face a moment of, of real reckoning here. You know, Mike Shirky's allyship, uh, with these white supremacist groups, uh, his duplicity uh, in the face that he puts forward to the public and then the face that he puts forward to these groups is is a, a serious problem. And the party is not going to appeal to the suburban voters that they lost in this last election uh, if they don't clean that up. Uh, it's, it's, mm. That's just, uh, uh, I think, a, a foregone conclusion. The other thing that they've got to contend with is that the map is not going to tilt to their advantage this time. They don't get to draw it. Uh, it's going to be drawn by an independent commission that is going to try to draw it fairly. That is going to result in losses because of uh, the switch from, from what they've been doing for the last two uh, cycles. So uh, they, they have a big hurdle in front of them. And, and again, it's a, it's a crisis of moral conscience, I think, more than anything else. It's interesting, Zoe. One of the things that maybe was a little bit lost in that recording uh, of, of Mike Shirky, um, he was being chastised in Hillsdale County for not being tough enough uh, mm -hmm. with, with, you know, not being far enough to the right uh, with Governor Whitmer. It's true. That was sort of the the, the prelude, right, of, of, of this week, uh, if you're writing the book, which was uh, this censure, uh, and then came out this recording. And, and thus is sort of the perfect example of where Republicans, uh, and whether it be their own fault or not, as, as Stephen said, for cozying up to some of these groups, um, find themselves in. And, and hearkening back to the national uh, perspective, it's what Mitch McConnell tried to do not so eloquently mm. uh, with this idea, which was, you know, uh, trying to both sides it, right? And and trying to say, uh, you know, I'm not going to vote for him, but what he did is deplorable. Um, and, and this is sort of what uh, you find Mike Shorkey trying to balance to do, and he is not doing it well. He is doing it ineloquently. Um, very quickly, I think it's important to note, though, that there really are two prongs of sort of Shirky and this past week. There is the prong, as Nolan said, of that he tends to say things uh, inarticulately, right? Um, that might be about the spanking of Whitmer, the fist fight to Whitmer. The second thing, though, that I think needs to be pulled out from that is his continuation uh, of his belief that January 6th was a hoax. And that, to me, is not articulate or saying uh, poorly worded statements. That, again, is continuing this idea. Um, I mean, he said as much that he believes the FBI is going to come out in the next few weeks and prove that it was Antifa or George Soros or whoever he thinks it is. Um, and I want to separate those two things from being uh, mm. inarticulate in your statements versus um, um, perpetuating uh, uh, insurrection. Yeah, can I just quickly, quickly add something to that? 10 seconds, Evans? guy. I can't do it in 10 seconds. I talked to Mike Shirky. He's not talking about Antifa. He's talking about right-wing extremists that he believes pre-planned the event. That's the subtle difference. I got to go, gang. Thanks so much for the time. Great to have you all back together, hopefully in person uh, the next time. Uh, Dr. Abdul El Sayed, and we continue on Flashpoint on Local 4. Hi, I'm Kathy from Independent Carpet One. Our staff and customers are like family, and we want to reassure you that we have taken every step necessary to ensure that you have a safe and positive experience while shopping in our showroom. This is a great time to learn about our Healthy Living installation, which provides a cleaner and more sanitized environment proven to inhibit the growth and spread of germs and viruses. We not only care about you, but your family too. Contact us to learn more or stop into our showroom today. Trust me, I'm a lawyer. Yeah, I know, it's a line that gets a laugh. 
until you've been in a serious auto accident. Then it's not a punchline. It's a lifeline. Because once you've made that call, it's out of your hands. You're all alone, and all you have is your attorney standing by you. Deep down, when everything depends on the energy, experience, and talent of your lawyer, who do you want in the fight of your life? We're unstoppable. Visit GollingBloomfield.com and lease or buy your next vehicle online. Only at Galling Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram in Bloomfield Hills. During the President's Day event, lease the 2021 Jeep Compass Limited 4x4, starting at 229 employee, 259 friends and family. Or take home the 2021 Jeep Wrangler Unlimited Willys 4x4 for only $347 a month employee, 392 friends and family. You search, you request, we deliver to your home or office. Shop GollingBloomfield.com. Galling Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram in Bloomfield Hills. Black history is American history. So to celebrate Black History Month, we're taking you to the places where it happened. Monday morning at 6.30, see how one of the few high-ranking African-American women in the Michigan State Police got her start and how she hopes to be a change maker. When I think about just being a black girl from the east side of Detroit, I never thought that I would be in such a position. Count on Local 4 News today to bring those historic moments to you. Welcome back with our very disjointed pandemic response on testing and if necessary treatment and now a really confusing vaccine program that seems to pinball between health care providers and counties and municipalities. Some have wondered if this is a good time to talk about single payer health care. What kind of difference would that make? It has a strong advocate in the former health director for the city of Detroit, former gubernatorial candidate Dr. Abdul El Sayed, who along with Micah Johnson has written a new book called Medicare for All, A Citizen's Guide. And Dr. El Sayed, good to have you back with us on Flashpoint. Good to see you again. Always great to see you, Devin. Thank you for, thank you for having me today. You bet. Before we, get, before we get to the book, as a former public health official and an epidemiologist by trade, give me your assessment of where we stand right now with the pandemic. Now, I'll be honest with you, this is a, a treacherous time. On the one hand, cases are down, and they're down considerably all over the country. Hospitalizations are down, and deaths are starting to creep down, too. And that's a great thing. At the same time, we have these variants, and these variants uh, we know have uh, different levels of resistance to our own acquired immunity that people get after they've gotten the illness, which means that they could spread quite rapidly. And so uh, we're in a moment right now where we've got good news, but we've got to keep it good news. And what we need to do is continue to follow basic public health protocols as we roll out these vaccines. We've got to remember that the vaccines are a really incredible engine. It's like a McLaren X1 engine, but you can't drop yeah. it in a Ford Pinto. And so we've got to keep doing uh, the rest of the work to contact trace, to test, uh, to, to socially distance, to wear our masks, to wash our hands, to make sure that we can beat these variants too and hopefully get out of this. Uh, it's hard to argue by almost any measure. The United States has had uh, one of the more uh, maladroit responses to the pandemic of the entire world. Do you think that that has to do more with our health care system and the way that we uh, sort of uh, meet out health care in America, or was it simply a, a government response that wasn't ready for what happened? You know, I see these two things as one in the same. In our country, we're one of the only high-income countries in the world that treats healthcare more as a business than as a right. And when you have a number of huge industries, some of the biggest uh, 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 sectors in the country uh, involved in the business of healthcare, there's very little incentive to prevent people from getting sick in the first place. There's a lot of money made off of people getting sick. And so we don't yeah. invest in basic public health infrastructure in this country the way that other countries do. And so our response was, anemic uh, and it was anemic because we haven't invested in those things that we needed uh, to be able to beat pandemics before they come and then when it hit us our healthcare system because of the way that it's set up is rickety uh, it's like the house of straw that blew over when the big bad wolf uh, blew on it and um, and that's because you know again it is all about a business and so we saw hospitals without basic PPE for uh, their their employees the frontline health care workers uh, we watched as people lost their health insurance because we tie health insurance to employment in this country 15 million people lost their health care while they lost their jobs in the middle of the worst pandemic in over a century and we still can't figure out how to deploy this medical marvel of a vaccine at any speed simply because we don't have the infrastructure to have done that and that's 
all because of the way that we've chosen to pay for and think about health care in our country. Meanwhile, 10 percent of people, even before this pandemic, didn't have health insurance at all. As you, though, now try to make the case for Medicare for all, what you run up against is people say, well, look how inept the government response has been to this, that, that, that government doesn't, you'll hear this time and time again, government doesn't run anything very well. Why would we turn something as important as our health care system over to be government run? You know, we make a choice in this country not to run anything in government very well. It's because we don't invest in it. It's because we think about government as part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And part of this is to say, well, actually, government is uniquely situated to solve a set of problems in our country that cannot be solved by markets as a function of how markets work, right? And you know, I always when I when I teach on these issues uh, with young people, I always ask them, how many of you would buy five MRIs for five hundred bucks right now? And most of them say no. And then I said, okay, well, if you were playing basketball and you tweaked your knee. If I sold you one MRI for 500 bucks, would you buy it? And almost all of them say yes. The point here <laughs> is that we don't want to buy health care. We want health. And after you hurt yourself, after you get sick, health care is a means to getting health. What that proves to you, right, is that health care is not a market good. Health care is something that we ought to think about as a right that we provide to every single person in the richest, most powerful country uh, in the world. And so uh, we've got to rethink this situation and we've got to rethink the way that we invest in government. Government doesn't have to be run poorly. Uh, it's a choice that we make uh, by people who want to tell us that actually the market can always do it better, even as we watch the market fail uh, at solving these basic questions. Well, clearly our system is inefficient. We spend more on health care than just about anybody in the world for not terrific results uh, and outcomes. But uh, the fights that we have seen at places like the nation's capital, at the Michigan State Capitol, I've gotten so many emails over the last four years from people saying, I don't like President Trump, but I fear the encroachment of socialism more than anything in American life. Um, I'm wondering, even though this is a very old idea, John Dingell famously uh, introduced it every year er, er, at the start of every congressional session. Uh, this is an old idea, but is it further away from uh, being done rather than than closer simply because of this uh, massive pushback against anything that approaches socialism? Yeah, I, I hear that question. I actually think we're a lot closer than we've ever been simply because, you know, you think about the median individual. We talk about a young woman, a Michigander actually, uh, named Lisa Cardillo. She was 36 years old uh, when she had a very rare form of heart attack. And uh, that was three years after her husband had suffered a brain tumor. And they had good health insurance through his employer, so they thought until they actually had to use it, in which case they were facing bankruptcy because of the cost of a deductible, a paywall that health insurers put up to get the health care that you already paid for uh, in your premiums every two weeks or every month. And so the people all over the country, all over our state are realizing that the system is just not working for them. I, I hear you on the scare word socialism, but here's the thing. People like to talk about this as a quote unquote government takeover of health care, but the doctor that you'd see, the hospital that you'd go and get health care from, they'd remain private. What differs is the middleman that we allow to exist in our system, taking $15 off the top of every $100 that we spend uh, in health insurance. Health insurance doesn't have to be uh, a, a, a good. It doesn't have to be something that you have to worry about keeping. Um, it can be something, just like our neighbors to the north know, that is provided by government so that you can then take that voucher uh, and see any private doctor or hospital that you want. That is not socialism. That is just a smart approach to government. And by the way, we do a lot of public things really well and we take them fully for granted, like roads or schools. Um, and we all know that if we did not do them well, that it would create a huge equity challenge, lower income people in rural communities all over this state and country, uh, uh, urban people all over cities uh, wouldn't get what they deserve. And they frankly aren't getting it now because we're not investing in those things. And so I, I don't hear the, the, the question of socialism, I think is a, bit of a, is a bit of a buzzword that people throw up to try and uh, turn us around, but we need to look through that and ask, actually ask the question. I got just a couple of seconds left. President Biden and others have talked about creating a public option rather than uh, going all in. Is that workable or does it have to be all or nothing? Well, look, I, I, I believe, I played football in high school, I believe that you can kick a field goal and come back and try and score for a touchdown. And um, I think we shouldn't take our eyes off the prize, even as we're trying to expand health insurance for folks in a public and uh, an effective way. And so I can support a public option and support Medicare for all at the same time. It's a really solid debate to have, uh, and especially given the times that we're in. I so appreciate having you back on Flashpoint, Dr. Abdul El Sayed. Good to see you again. I hope we'll uh, continue the conversation down the road. Devin, it is always a privilege. You stay safe, and everybody out there, make sure you wear your mask and wash your hands. We'll get through this. You got it. We'll take a quick break. Back with more on Flashpoint right after this. 
Your heart deserves quality care, and the board-certified cardiologists at Heart and Vascular Institute are dedicated to providing that. I collapsed and was taken through to the Heart and Vascular Institute. That's the reason I'm here today. Heart and Vascular Institute is equipped with three state-of-the-art facilities, an outpatient surgery center, and on-site diagnostics. At the Heart and Vascular Institute, we have a very unique model. The physician and the patients are involved in shared decision making. Call and schedule a consultation today and learn more at heartteam.com. Yep, we cover Michigan. From Old Mission to New Hudson and Kitchy to Kippy to Christmas, we cover snow filled days to frosty noses and whistling winds to whiteouts. We're there for ice scraping, holiday shopping, and warming your toes by the fire. We insure auto, home, business, life, and yep, you guessed it, farm. Yep, we cover Michigan because we're Michigan's insurance company. Find your coverage anywhere in Michigan at FarmBureauInsurance.com. Get ready for the time of your life at Circa Resort and Casino, Las Vegas' newest destination for fun, featuring the world's biggest poolside tailgate party with three levels of action, six pools, and a 143-foot screen. The fun is always on deck with all the games all year long. Stadium Swim, located in downtown Las Vegas on Fremont Street. Book the time of your life today at CircaLasVegas.com. To all medical personnel, thank you. To those stocking shelves, delivering supplies, and getting us to work, thank you. To police, firefighters, military, and city services, saving lives and making lives better, thank you. To those manning gas stations, food banks, drug stores, and more. To good neighbors, great teachers, and those who helped others make it through this difficult year. From Local 4 and Click on Detroit, thank you. Before we go, funeral services were held yesterday for Detroit attorney Cliff Woodards, and so we at Flashpoint say our fond goodbyes as well. Great sense of humor, an infectious laugh. We and Detroit are going to miss it. Meet the Press is next. See you next week.